torpedo factory in Gurup celebrates its centenary in 2012. Over the last 100 years, the club has been an important contributor to the culture and social fabric of our town. Its history is fascinating. Later, you will hear the stories of the first employees who came here from Woolwich and some of the problems they encountered. You will also hear recollections of club members and indeed employees who worked in the torpedo factory at Battery Park. It's been an interesting 100 years. Let's hear from the current president, Tommy McCauley. I've been a member of the factory club for 29 years. I joined in 1983. I was a Vice President right up to this year when I became President. At present moment there's uh, male and female about 400. The biggest changes that I've noticed is uh, the licensing hours getting later. You'll not believe it but it was uh, a lottery, it sort of caused a downfall of the people coming out later plus the X Factor and these different programmes and shift work, the shift work within the district has caused a bit of an upheaval. If people can't get out on a Saturday night when they used to come out on a Saturday night and vice versa. We're, we're holding our own. We're, we're struggling, but we're, you know what I mean, we're breaking even most weeks. And we're as good as any other club that's going about at this time for any length of time, but hopefully we would hope to be here in a hundred years. We'd really like to be here in a hundred years. The town of Woolwich is noted for many things for being the first location in the UK to host a McDonald's fast food restaurant, for its eponymously named building society, and, of the greatest impact, its Royal Arsenal, producing torpedoes and artillery since 1872. During this period, between the late 19th and early 20th centuries, war never seemed far away, creating a huge demand for ammunition. Although work in the industry was dangerous, the arsenal was still considered a renowned centre of excellence in mechanical engineering, with state-of-the-art technology and cutting-edge techniques being employed by noteworthy engineers of the day, so employment there was sought after and revered. The workers of the arsenal always had a strong sense of camaraderie and community, and the Dial Square workshops even formed their own football club in 1866. The club originally known as Dial Square, quickly changed their name to Royal Arsenal before altering it to Woolwich Arsenal when they became a limited company in 1893. They finally settled on a name in 1914, familiar to most today, Arsenal. Patrick Boylan, born in Greenock in 1876, was one of many talented footballers enticed to play for the team. With one catch, only factory workers could play. He didn't allow this to stand in his way, and in 1896, he took a job at the factory so he could join the club. But success was short-lived, and when the work was sent north, many of the locals followed, leaving the club with few supporters. This was considered by many to be the reason for the club's decline at this time. In 1908, the Admiralty announced that they would be constructing a new torpedo factory in Greenock, on the shore of the River Clyde. The location was chosen as it was directly opposite Loch Long where they planned on testing their product. It was considered ideal due to its sheltered position, great depth of water and comparative freedom from traffic. The fact that the land was owned by Sir Hugh Shaw Stewart, who had desired to keep the West End free of industrial development, did not deter the Admiralty, who informed him in no uncertain terms that they could take his land compulsorily through an Act of Parliament. He was assured, however, that their presence would neither be dangerous nor become in any way a nuisance to the inhabitants. By 1910, when the plant officially opened, 700 workers and their families had arrived from Woolwich to oversee the running of the operation. Woolwich's loss is to be green as gain as hordes of workers have already started arriving per Caledonian Railway, many of the families having already secured housing in the central part of town. The building of the £60,000 torpedo factory has been contracted to Mercer's. Robert Neal and Co. from Manchester and will cover 10 acres. Local labour is to be employed using machinery driven by electricity from the Greenock Corporation. The Evening Express reported that the factory would employ 400 men, although 600 jobs would be lost at Woolwich due to the removal of the plant. These men were told that they would receive preference for employment at the new works. Most were adverse to the imminent change. One told the Express that he lived in Woolwich all his life. George Henry Freeman, a Woolwicher born and bred, came to Greenock with the initial influx of workers 
relocating his family in the process. They moved to Manor Crescent, Guruk, where their daughter Ethel was born. George Henry was given an Imperial Service Medal in 1946 to recognise his meritorious service during his career. His daughter Ethel married John Taylor, who also worked in the service of the torpedo factory. Like his father-in-law, John, or Jack to friends, family and colleagues, was recognised for his service. Many local builders took advantage of the arrivals and fewed land around the factory to create accommodation for the workers and their families. The subsequent years saw a massive population increase in Greenock, overwhelming the level of available accommodation. The desperation of the immigrants could be read in the Greenock Telegraph's reports of Sassanac audacity, basically families utilising any occupied homes in order to store their furniture. Clearly there was a need for additional housing and in 1914 a complaint was heard by the local government that adequate measures had not been taken to home the imported workforce. Appalled at what was considered acceptable housing in Scotland, the Woolwich immigrants wrote to express their dissatisfaction at the lack of consideration for their English ideals. In their opinion, the Scotch homes lacked natural light and private grounds and the bedrooms were too small although they did concur that the reception rooms were larger in Scotland. There were also sublets available for those without families, although many chose to settle, marrying locals and laying down roots. Richard Clifford arrived in Greenock in 1910, residing in Fort Matilda with other unmarried torpedo factory workers like himself. The following year he met his wife-to-be, Marion Ferguson. They married on the 8th of September 1911 and the children soon followed. It wasn't long before news travelled of the employment opportunities available at the new factory, and soon many other immigrants began to arrive, looking for work. This influx of newcomers, known locally as English invaders and Sassanacs, invoked a wave of xenophobia among the locals, breeding curiosity and suspicion. This reaction, adopted by many of the locals, forced the ostracised outsiders to form their own community in order to ease the transition and the Torpedo Factory Club was born. I was a torpedo man in the Navy. Oh, right, uh-huh. And through that, I'd been through a torpedo factory and everything. Through that, we come down here as in guests, and they give us a temporary membership then. Right. Over time, the Wiltshire's not only integrated, but they flourished, lending views and opinions and flavouring the perception. One of these individuals was James Rees Pebbler, who was elected provost and served between 1937 and 1940. The issue of housing was obviously important to the immigrants as it remained a priority through the years, and Provost Pedler became another voice for the community, fighting for better homes. Now, when I left school, um, I went in to start my apprenticeship in the torpedo factory. The torpedo factory stretched from where Fun World is right up to the Navy buildings at the end of the Esplanade and they produced, during the war, they produced torpedoes in there. But after the war, they took the production of torpedoes from Greenock over to Alexandria in the Vale of Raven. And the Greenock Torpedo Factory then became the Torpedo Experimental Establishment, such as we had, uh, made up torpedoes, played with them, invented. And the main thing was to do away with the track of a torpedo. We hadn't all these electronics then, but it was to do away with the track that the compressed air left and when it would come out the tube, they could, oh, there's a torpedo coming. So, but we experimented with that, but it was too dangerous. After the war, with less demand for munitions, the factory began to ramp down their production and eventually moved all their work to the new plant at Alexandria. The torpedo factory is now Fun World. As far as I know, my dad, Arthur Thompson, always started out in the wine and spirit trade. He ran various, worked in pubs as a young man, and uh, I've seen photographs of old pubs he worked in in Old Greenock, which I don't remember. But my earliest recollection mostly was of him working in the factory club as clubmaster. At that time, I remember some of the people that worked for him. He had a fellow called Simi Maroney, who's well known in Guruk. He had a chip shop, it was a local Italian family. I think it was called the Jolly Friar. <laughs> and then he gravitated to another uh, shop. And a fellow called Robert Macaulay, who I believe still lives in Guru, he 
he worked for my dad, and I think he eventually, many years later, became the manager of the place, the club master. He was here before the war, and he was here after the war. When he came back from North Africa, he got his job back again. My main uh, association with here was through the sport of table tennis. I was a keen player as a young man, and they had a club in the factory club and a table, which I think they've still got to this day, the same table. I even remember the name of it, I think it's a Jacks. It's still used in this club on a Tuesday night, I believe, by some of the local guys. In those days, they had a team in the Great District League. And I recollect two men I thought were wonderful players who were older than me. And their name were Walker and Chantry. On a Saturday afternoon, I used to invite maybe a couple of good players to come down here with me to improve my game. My dad would lock up the bar at two o'clock, lock us in here with crisps and lemonade, and that was us in until five o'clock at night, <laughs> till they let us back out again. And so all we could do was eat crisps, drink lemonade, and play all afternoon. That helped me a lot to get on, and the sport I eventually became I'm a Scottish coach and won a lot of tournaments over the years, but that helped me on the way. And my recollection is the club was busy. And in this hall we're sitting and I remember coming to like concerts and people singing on here as a young man, mm -hmm. including my dad. It was like, a, if you like, maybe a, an early community centre mm -hmm. with an into different, maybe before its time. We used to have a Father Christmas. And one year my dad was telling me, it was like a kind of funny story, there was a guy, it was Father Christmas, and somebody pulled his beard down and somebody said, oh, it's wee Archie Blue or something, it's no Father Christmas. Mm -hmm. But they used to have that every year, quite good. Christmas things for kids in here, mm -hmm. where everyone get presents. Mm -hmm. They had outings and things. Mm -hmm. Their families did various activities going on here. It was a, a hub. Mm -hmm. It's almost, as I say, an early community centre. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of family orientated, I would say. As you have heard, over the years, the club has encouraged many social sections and sports events involving the local community and many of them. These included athletics, swimming galas, fishing expeditions, cricket and football teams and many others. In addition, the original factory club had its own library. The membership peaked in the 60s and 70s and indeed there was a waiting list to join and a grilling from the committee for aspiring members. I joined the factory club in 1966. I was a social convener during the 70s, the heyday of the club. At that time you had the three floors going. It was really, really, really busy. Uh, it was a really, really well-run club then, and Bert Fleming, who was the secretary at the time, he, he ran it really, really well. Jackie Magney, he, he was a president, but he was a social convener before I took over, uh, and it was a good club, it was excellent. The membership at that time, it was massive, I don't know, I can't quote numbers, but maybe about 300 or maybe 400. Uh, when I was here, uh, we it was still the children's streets, they were just almost finished, but they were still on the go. Uh, I actually organised a few of them. I think one of the ones I organised was in Cragburn. <coughs> uh, and that was, was good. And we had plenty of, plenty of people to come and help help out. You know, there was always, always plenty of volunteers. Mm -hmm. Just like the old villages were still about at the time, I think. I'm sure there was. I'm sure there was. So maybe, it, maybe not. I said, well, there probably would be. Because mm -hmm. you're asking back about, about 50 years. Aye. There was a, a chap, he was a great cyclist, uh, Wally Barber, and his father was one of the founder members. When I, I, I used to book the groups, uh, I used to, there was maybe about 20, 30, 40 local groups. But now you've got to get out of town to get a group. Mm -hmm. There's very, very few local ones. We used to use the three floors. We used to bingo up the stair, bingo down the stair, uh, and bingo in the, the, the main hall here. And you had a chap up the stair he was somebody shouted up, he would shout down, and somebody down the stairs, he'd shout up, he, he would shout up, you know. The cabarets were absolutely fantastic, but a lot of, a lot of excellent cabarets. One of the most popular acts was uh, Peter McGinney. Uh, he was very, very popular. He was he was really, really good. Uh, with some great nights with him. Uh, Joe Fisher, he was a, a cabaret. He, he actually came along a few times as well. He was actually excellent as well. Another thing we used to do, uh, we used to have a film night in here. Mm -hmm. That was on a Wednesday night. Uh, there was a guy who worked in IBM. He used to come down with his projector and we, we 
thing, the thing, the films, the first film we had was Papillon. And we actually joined two, we actually mm -hmm. joined two screens together to try and get a cinemascope effect. <laughs> <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> no, it didn't really work. It didn't really work. Do you know we, we had the snooker championships in here? We Ray Reardon, John Spencer, uh, Terry Griffith and uh, Dennis Taylor. Right. Dennis Taylor, he was funny, he, he was he was excellent. The high hug the table from down the stairs, hug it up, I mean that's some weight. Hug it up the stairs and set it up in here. Are you joking? Uh, so who done that? Oh, anybody, any, any <laughs> volunteers? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. In fact, one of the nights in here, uh, it was a must be a Christmas dance, and uh, we took one of these ceiling tiles out, and we put a cardboard box, and we, 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 we put it up inside, and we stuffed all the balloons in, and we got a, a line running from the stage, and we put tissue paper to hold the balloons up, and we put a, a line round it, and we took it back to the stage. And then we summed it at a given time just to pull the string. And it worked. No, it, was, it was a good club. It's, it's still, still going, fortunately. I wish I could go on for at least another hundred years. It would really be happy. Yeah. I wouldn't be here to see it, but somebody would be here. And I hope that would really last a long, long time.